In April 1999, a famous TV personality was gunned down on the doorstep of a home in Fulham, London. Whilst a nation reeled in shock, a murder inquiry was launched that would become the biggest ever conducted by the Metropolitan Police and the largest criminal investigation since the hunt for the Yorkshire Ripper. This is one of the most notorious unsolved crimes of the 20th century. This is the murder of Jill Dando. Welcome back to my channel, thank you for joining me. I didn't know whether to do this particular case. It's an older one, but then I was speaking to an ex-copper, ex-DCI who I know very well, and when he started to talk about the fact that he'd been involved in the very early experience of the investigations, I was so compelled with some of the information that he told me that I felt I wanted to cover it as best as I can with all the information that is out there. If you don't know the Jill Dando case, it was enormous. It was totally shocking in the UK that this really well-loved TV personality could essentially be executed at her own home. It was something that blindsided the nation. There was nothing about this woman in any way, shape or form that could lead you or lend you to have an understanding of why this kind of killing could occur. So today, we're going to be going through this. And for all of you who are new to my channel, you might have just found this because you're interested in Jill Dando's case per se. My name's Emma Kenny. I release my content on a Wednesday and a Sunday. Religiously, crime consistency is my catchphrase. Thank you to all of you who are returning. You know, I love you. And if you haven't got your subscription yet, please do subscribe. Get your notifications on. Let it inform you when I am releasing this content. Cheers to you who are supporting my YouTube membership and, of course, my Patreon. Can't do this without you. I adore you fully. Let's get on with today's case. So for me, if you think about Princess Diana, she was known as the People's Princess. Then in the 1990s, Jill Dando in Britain was the nation's sweetheart. She was an absolute golden girl of TV. And she was a household name. She'd had this really sparkling 10-year career. And prior to doing television, she'd actually been a newspaper journalist, and that was in her hometown of Western Supermare, which is in the southwest of England, lovely area. Her first broadcasting gig was with the BBC Radio Devon, that's a particular radio station I have been on many, many times. They're very, very lovely at BBC Radio Devon. But that's where she began her career. She was reading news bulletins. And in 1999, she actually stated that she genuinely couldn't be happier in her life. Career had been going from strength to strength. She'd been presenting shows that were really, really diverse as well. So she was one of those presenters who was transversing and moving through her original station, so to speak, around news bulletins and actually making a real name for herself as an individual presenter. So she was doing things such as the six o'clock news, breakfast news, songs of praise, the infamous Crime Watch, which is a show that has stood the test of time in the UK. She also presented a show called Holiday. She'd been named uh, the BBC's Personality of the Year in 1997. And she was somebody that everybody knew. If you lived in the UK, you knew who Jill Dando was. It was a time, remember, before the digital era. You didn't have Netflix, Now TV, Prime and everything else. And the reality of that was that because you were tied to a certain amount of channels and she was all over them, you knew who she was. But as she went through her career, she decided that she needed to also look at her personal life. She wanted to cut down particularly on the holiday programs. She wanted a less frantic life and she got to a place where her personal life was in a really, really good place. In January of 1997, 
she actually got engaged to gynaecologist Alan Farthing. Alan Farthing, bit of trivia for you, he later became Queen Elizabeth's personal physician. So our beloved Queen Elizabeth, who we've recently lost, he was the personal physician who tended to her. And she and he had met on a blind date. And it had been a very intense relationship. They'd quickly fallen in love. And Jill was massively excited about the fact that she was getting married to her beloved fiance on the 25th of September, 1999. This was gonna be a huge year for her personally. And after building her career to such an iconic level, it was also a moment in time where she could take her foot off the accelerator and just enjoy the new opportunities that her love life was presenting. And obviously with that huge intention about forming and forging a family that she dreamed of. We get, however, to Monday the 26th of April, 1999. And this is where everything changes, where all of those plans fall apart and an inconceivable, astonishing event plays out. On this particular day, 37-year-old Jill, she leaves her fiance's home in Chiswick, West London. It's around 10 a.m. in the morning. She'd been staying there for the past few days. So on that morning, she sets off in a dark blue BMW convertible. She's heading to her Fulham home. But then she ended up doubling back because she decided she wanted to go shopping in Hammersmith. She stopped for petrol along the A4. This is along the way to go to those shops. And then after parking in Hammersmith, she goes in the King's Mall shopping centre. And this is all captured on CCTV. And that's both outside and inside the actual shopping centre. They see what she's wearing. She was wearing a beige raincoat, red button up jacket, and she was also wearing black trousers and boots. They saw that she was carrying a white carrier bag in her left hand with a black handbag over her right shoulder. Then we get to the minutes between 10.36 a.m. and 10.50 a.m. Here she's seen buying materials for a fax machine. This includes paper from Ryman's and Dixon's. And then she actually physically leaves the shopping centre just after 11 a.m. At 11.20 a.m., again, she's seen stopped on Fulham Road because she's on the way home. And she basically stops there because she calls a fishmonger. She buys two billets of Dover soles. And it's believed that she took her phone call while she was in that shop. This is at 11.23 a.m. And of course, what's really upsetting and troubling is that we know, but she certainly didn't know, that that was the last phone call that she would ever take. So she arrives back at her home, 29 Gowan Avenue, Fulham. This is at 11.30 a.m. She'd previously lived in the house, but even though it was still hers, she was actually in the process of selling it. And that's important to note because Jill Dando did not go there very often. She didn't visit it regularly. Just keep that in mind for what we're going to talk about later on. Now, at 11.31 a.m., she does actually receive another call, but it's a call that she doesn't answer. It goes to voicemail. And the investigators believe that the reason that it went to voicemail is because by this time, she was dead. She was shot once in the head, literally on the doorstep of her own home. The neighbour who actually found Jill collapsed outside her front door found her about 14 minutes after she was shot and then immediately called emergency services. You can't quite imagine the moment of origin of impact this neighbour coming out and finding somebody hugely recognisable anyway, but certainly somebody that she knew, and recognising that something dreadful had befallen her. It's so astonishing, it's so unbelievable. It's just Jill Dando. You don't expect somebody like Jill Dando to get executed on her doorstep. Thank you, Hi. ambulance service, hello. Hello, ambulance, I'm walking along Gowan Avenue. It looks like um, there's something collapsed um, confidentially, it looks like it's Jill Dando and she's collapsed in her door. There's a lot of blood. Did you just approach and check that the lady's breathing for me? She doesn't look as if she's breathing. Oh she's got blood coming from her nose, her arms are blue. I just need to find out if she needs, if she's breathing. Is the lady's chest going up and down? Oh my God, no, I don't think she's alive. Right, okay. <laughs> Sorry, no, I don't worry, I'm going to get some help there in a second. The police and the paramedics rush to the scene. 
And at this point, the main intention is to see whether there is any salvaging Jill's life. They attempt CPR. They try their best to resuscitate her, but unfortunately it's unsuccessful. She's then taken to the nearby Charing Cross Hospital and she's immediately pronounced dead on arrival. This is at 1.03 p.m. The forensic scene, they descend on the crime scene very, very quickly. Of course they do. This is enormous. Whenever a murder plays out, it is big news. That's the reality. And sometimes it can feel because of our 24 seven media outlets that people are literally being murdered everywhere. But the reality is that it's still a rare event. Additionalize that with the reality that we're dealing with a household name in television. This is something that the police and investigators desperately want to bring to a close. They want to bring the murderer in ASAP because firstly, this is going to be huge. It's going to be all over the press. They're going to have to get things right. They're going to have people looking at them under a microscope. And also there is a personal feeling here. When you are a celebrity at the level of Jill Dando, everybody owns a piece of you. Everybody feels that they know you. Everybody is invested in your killer being brought to justice because you feel that you know this person, it's personal. And in the UK, that's exactly how it felt. It was personal. That's why this case is still one of the biggest that we talk about because Jill Dando had meaning to so many millions of people in the UK. And again, I bring in the reality that this is a time where you didn't have the plethora of channels that you have nowadays. So genuinely in the UK of the 60 odd million people who live here, most felt that Jill Dando had a level of meaning in their life. So it's enormous. And when the forensics get there, they're obviously desperate to figure out what's played out. They notice that there's blood splatter on the front door. Also, there was a trail of blood along the path leading to the house. They found Jill's handbag that was on the front doorstep and they find the bullet and also a spent nine millimeter cartridge. They recover that from the scene as well. When they do the autopsy, and the forensic examination, they established that Jill had been killed by a single gunshot wound to the head. Now we'll probably never know for definite how the actual killing unfolded. However, when you look at the evidence, it's believed that she put the keys in the front door and at this point she's grabbed basically from behind. Then her attacker forced her to the ground with his right arm. And that would mean that her face was almost touching the doorstep. And then with his left hand, he basically put the barrel of the gun, pressed it to her left temple because there was a small cut above the bullet wound. So that's probably made by the pressure of the sights at the end of the barrel, just pressing into her head and brazing the skin. The bullet had entered her left side of her head. So just above um, behind her left ear and it had exited from the right side of her head. So just in front and at the top of her right ear. Now being that Jill had been shot point blank range as I've just described, it actually meant that the end of the gun in Jill's head had basically formed a seal. So explosive gases had entered into the bullet hole and muffled the shot. So it had reduced the noise that that shot actually created. Now, because of that injury, you can imagine it went straight through. She suffered massive brain trauma and the belief is that she would have died almost instantly. In fact, the keys to her car were still in her hand. So it's not like there were defense wounds. She wasn't fighting back. This is a scenario where somebody is totally taken in a shocking situation where they're not really aware what's happening and it all plays out so quickly. On one level, that's a positive because none of us would wish that Jill would ever suffer or even be aware of what was playing out the moments that her killing occurred. So the fact that she died instantly, the fact that she seems not to have had any instinct to fight back, that is a sense of comfort, I suppose, for us to imagine that she didn't really compute what was playing out. Now the forensic ballistics, they noted six markings on the cartridge used to kill Jill. So the suspected murder weapon that they believe had been used had been a replica or a decommissioned gun. So it had a low muzzle velocity and they believe it had been modified in a workshop. Now the firearm discharge residue, that's known as FDR, that was found in the cartridge, so in the cartridge case itself, the bullet wound and Jill's hair. Now in guns, primers are used to actually ignite the main powder charge that propels the bullet. 
and traces of that primer can be detected in the discharge residue and analysed. Now, in this case, the FDR was percussion primer caps residue. And the thing about percussion primer caps residue is it doesn't degrade with time. It's metal based. So it's composed of barium, aluminium and lead. And it just doesn't degrade. So the murder investigation that is launched, it's called Operation Oxborough. And as I said earlier on, it basically becomes the biggest ever murder inquiry conducted by the Metropolitan Police. And it's the largest criminal investigation since the hunt for the Yorkshire Ripper. The police, they do door-to-door -door inquiries. Of course they do, because in the local area, hopefully there might be a witness. And they speak to a neighbour of Jill's. And he said that one of the things that he'd noted was that he heard Jill's car alarm activate as she walked away from the vehicle. Also, he heard the latch opening on her garden gate but then he heard her scream. Now he said, the scream itself had more of a pitch of a scream of surprise than it did of terror. So again, playing into that reality that the likelihood is that Jill was just in shock. You know, she didn't even have time to be terrified. She was just in shock. What on earth is happening? Who is this grabbing me? But he hadn't heard a gunshot. Now he looked out of the window. It had driven him to kind of inspect what on earth is playing out and what he did see was a man walking away from Jill's house immediately after he heard this. Now he described this man as aged anywhere between his late 30s to 40s. He said he was around five foot nine to six foot tall which you can imagine if you're looking out of a window it's really hard to gauge the height of someone. If somebody's wearing for example really sharp suit and nice clothes you put them up as taller than they actually are because you have a bias to believe that somebody dressed nicely who's successful is going to be taller so it's really hard unless you have something to gauge their height with so that's why there's a disparity between five foot nine and six foot. He said that he had short black or dark brown hair noted that he was smartly dressed he said he was in a dark suit or jacket and trousers. So at this point, at least the police are able to let a description and e-fit be released to the public. Even though this is an absolutely enormous investigation, bear in mind, it seems so random. This is Jill Dander, who has anything against this woman? Literally, she was like sunshine and ice cream in the UK. There was nothing sinister about this woman. She wasn't provocative. She wasn't a nasty human being. She wasn't somebody who was divisive. Everybody liked her. So that's going to be really, really difficult initially because who on earth would be a suspect for killing this woman? And we get to the first six months of the investigation. So at this point, the police are still basically speaking to people who may have seen something, may have heard something, trying to piece together what could have happened. And they speak to two and a half thousand people. You just have to imagine the amount of administration there and how many differing stories and how many dead ends are going on. The case itself is just huge. It's everywhere. It's got this massive publicity. The media coverage is intense beyond belief. And the police are flooded with lots of different leads because people genuinely are invested in bringing Jill Dando's killer to justice. So everyone wants to do their best to tell the police things that may have some kind of weight when it comes down to the investigation. And every single one of those possible leads that the public put forward were investigated. There were so many rumors so much speculation about the possible motives that had led to her killing. Now, as I've said, when you drill down into the bare bones of this case, Jill Dando had no known enemies. And there must have been an incredible pressure on the authorities to just bring somebody to justice for the brutal slaying of such a popular and well-loved woman. But even after a year, investigators have made no arrests, and they were no closer to solving the crime. This is despite investigating 2,000 potential suspects and plowing money into this particular case. Nada, they were getting nowhere. It was so frustrating. Now, there were many potential motives for the murder as put forward by other people, whether we believe that they make sense or otherwise, they were certainly areas that the police wanted to look at because they wanted to leave no stone 
left unturned. So ex-partners get interviewed, they get eliminated from the inquiries. The authorities even investigate a Russian crime lord who apparently became really transfixed and fixated and infatuated with Jill when she was filming Holiday. She was basically in Cyprus doing that show. He'd come on to her, she'd rejected his advances, and there was a possible theory that maybe he'd killed her in revenge. But again, investigators found no evidence of this. And let's all agree that a spurned advancement of a potential lover is not usually something that means you get killed. Just throwing it out there, we have our insecurities, but very few of us are that insecure that we think, gonna have her executed. But nonetheless, it demonstrates just how desperate the police were to actually bring this person to justice and to make sure that there was no question that they'd been diligent on the investigation. Still, in spite of all these theories, there did remain a possibility that it had been a hit. And now the reason for this is the MO did have hallmarks of a professional execution. It was a single shot to the head in broad daylight. Killer had basically managed to flee the scene. It was only seen by one person, allegedly. And therefore, there was a theory that it could have been arranged in revenge by someone affected by a Crime Watch appeal because she presented this show called Crime Watch, which a lot of you in the UK will know. If you don't know what it is, basically it's a show where we have like Britain's Most Wanted on it. We have crimes that have been unsolved where they reenact them and they hope that it will shake somebody's memory. And actually it's been really successful in bringing thousands of criminals and closing many unsolved cases because they get solved because of this. And because she was a host, there was this potential that maybe there there were people out there who were angry that she was the front of it and the consequence was that those people lost their freedom or potentially they were sniffing around as a show an area that organised gangs didn't want solving and so on and so forth. Again, even though I can make sense of why they would have that theory, at the same time I also know that it doesn't take much for criminals to realise that she's just a presenter. Much like when they read the news and they're doing the auto cue, they're not actually the person responsible for whatever they're talking about, you know? But I get it. I get that they're thinking it could have been arranged by somebody who felt that she'd affected their freedom, or maybe it was a message from the London underworld, don't interfere with organised crime and so on and so forth. And I'm not going to play that away because the truth is that the level of corruption in the police and within organised crime together at that point in London, in this particular era, it was huge. So I suppose there are potentials there, but arguably I still think that's quite a stretch that it was the underworld in London thinking that they wanted to execute her. Because again, I don't think that they would ever want to be discovered and they would know that the police were gonna put everything into finding out who had done this. It's not very effective if you're trying to evade being caught. But of course, that's just my theory on that. It doesn't mean it's embedded in any reality. I just like logic, and I think it's not the most logical position to take that it was the underworld in London. Now, there was also a possibility put forward that it was a Serbian contract killing. Now, really, this is because the newspapers started to put this out within 48 hours of Jill's murder. So it wasn't something the police were contemplating, but the mainstream press were saying this was a position that they believed was possible. And it was based on the fact that NATO and the UK were fighting against Serbia in Kosovo, in the war in Kosovo. So just before Jill's murder, so this is on the night of the 23rd to the 24th of April 1999, NATO, they'd bombed the radio television of Serbia headquarters, and that was owned by the Serbian commander Slobodan Milosevic's family. Now in that strike, 16 employees had been killed, and following Jill's death, Several people have basically contacted the media outlets and claimed responsibility on behalf of Serb groups. So this is a theory that is therefore being peddled in the press. And the day, so literally the day after Jill's killing, the BBC's head of news, Tony Hall, he allegedly received a call from a man with an East European accent who stated, your Prime Minister Blair butchered innocent young people. We butcher back. So that in itself was threatening and obviously because we were in the light of Jill being executed in something that seemed to be so out of the ordinary, there was no reasoning behind it, 
Understandably, the police had to look at that. I think what we also need to be aware of, however, is at this time there were a lot of feelings that were running very deep about the hideous war crimes that Tony Blair involved himself in. So even though it seems like it could be linked, there are so many people out there who just want to let people know in the press how unhappy they are because of the awful atrocities that had happened under Blair's watch, essentially. So it doesn't necessarily mean that they can link it directly. It could just be somebody who's trying to prove a point regarding their feelings towards the treachery that had been playing out under Blair in the government at the time. So the way that they try to tie this situation back to Jill, as in, well, OK, we're getting these calls. People are suggesting that they've taken claim for killing her. How does that link back, really, to Jill being the intended target? So they suggested that her disasters emergency committee appeal, this was basically an appeal that she did for aid for Kosovan refugees, could have basically made her a target. So 20 days before she was actually murdered, on the 6th of April 1999, she'd fronted this BBC Kosovo crisis appeal, and it did really well. It raised more than a million pounds in 24 hours. So police then investigated the various calls to the media outlets because they needed to see whether there was any truth and is it that she's become a hit because of her support in this area, but it concluded that every single one of them were hoaxes. Now, whilst a lot of people believe that this was a professional hit, if you go online, if you listen to some of the documentaries, there's very much a belief system in areas that it must have been this execution by a hitman, by somebody professional. Whilst it does share some similarities with the professional hit, I'll be honest, investigators and even myself when I've done the research, not completely sold on this theory. So there are a lot of elements to the killing that suggest it wasn't professional. So first of all, if you're a professional assassin, you're going to know the movements of your particular client that you've got to take out, so to speak. But you're also going to be methodical and it's going to be a habitual. So you're going to turn up places where you know they're going to be at a certain time. But Jill rarely visited her home at the time of the killing. It was up for sale. She wasn't spending time there. So the assassin who would be following her normal footsteps, they wouldn't have known she was going to be there. Also, CCTV footage that they pieced together of her final movements didn't suggest that anybody was following her. And furthermore, it's highly unlikely that a professional contract killer would have used a substandard modified gun or left an incriminating shell case at the actual crime scene. Also, another thing is that a professional hit would likely have shot Jill more than once because they have a presence to actually make sure that the target is dead. And even though a bullet through the head is often lethal and fatal, two is probably going to determine that you don't have to worry about a witness ever surviving. Now, nevertheless, what I would say is that in spite of the investigators being quite clear as to why they don't believe it was a professional hit, still to this day, the Serbian hitman theory endures. So it's still one that many, many people believe. There was also a rumour that Jill had investigated a BBC paedophile network in the mid-1990s. Apparently, the rumour was that she presented her findings to the broadcasting network. And we all know that in the BBC broadcasting network, there was a hideous, hideous cover-up of some of the worst human beings to ever grace our planet. Jimmy Savile being one of them. Feel free to watch my video on that whole heap of wrong. So there is no doubt whatsoever that in institutions where there is power and money, there is also a corruption. And without a doubt, the fact that these kind of powerful entities do exist in certain places, it gives them a leverage of power. And if you cross them, there could be some pretty dreadful repercussions. Back in the day, however, I'm going to throw it out there, you could literally turn up as a victim with your evidence, probably all on camera, and they still wouldn't have believed you. So again, even though she's meant to have handed over this particular revelations doc that people were going to be aware that she knew all this internal horror of the BBC, and as we know, in the end, those high-profile celebrities who were operating within the BBC were actually 
outed, so to speak. They said when they were asked about this apparent dossier that she'd given them, it never happened, that there was no evidence to support this theory whatsoever. The BBC had never been handed this at all. So all of these ideas that still are whispered around this particular killing, most of them have been fully discounted. So the investigators then decide that they need to focus on another theory. Maybe, just maybe, Jill could have been killed by a crazed stalker. And at this point, they zero in basically on an unemployed 39-year-old man called Barry George. It's also known as Barry Bulsara. What would I say about this particular individual? Well, to use a quote, not from myself, it isn't a very professional statement that I'm going to make, but from those around him, he had a reputation as the local weirdo. And his name had been handed in basically, it was a tip off to the police, and that tip off came a day after the murder. And this person who'd actually got in contact referred to a mentally unstable man. So when you actually look at this particular individual. He did have a history of antisocial behavior. He had a history of stalking women. And let's all remember that this idea that stalking women is an activity that remains stalking, it just is not true. I mean, I think in the early 70s to 80s, even to the early 90s, there was this ludicrous mindset that it was just somebody who was a little bit odd following you and they really didn't mean any harm until they killed you which happened a lot, or raped you, which happened a lot. So at the end of the day, this mindset of the time was that stalkers didn't present harm and people didn't presume harm about their actions. Totally ridiculous, absolutely makes no sense. And even, let's put it into the context that a stalker does just follow you, does just turn up at your house every single day, does find out where you work, does come to your home constantly uninvited and so on and so forth, that's horrific psychologically. That is violence. It really is because it changes every aspect of your world and your life and your being, but it wasn't taken very, very seriously. So he'd had all of this history. He'd also actually been convicted of attempted rape and indecent assault when he was 22. That's a high level sex offender. And also his ex-wife, she accused him of assault and their marriage had actually only lasted a year. But on top of this, he'd even been found in 1983 hiding in the bushes at Kensington Palace. Now, bear in mind, for those of you who don't know Kensington Palace in the UK, it was where Prince Charles and Lady Diana lived at the time. And when they found him, he was armed with two knives and a 15-foot coil of rope. He was also wearing combat gear and an SAS gas mask. Also, apparently, he was in a possession of a poem that he'd written for Charles. And when the police catch this guy, armed, disguised, with some kind of like obsessive fixation potentially on Charles, the police felt that he was a harmless eccentric, took no further action. I don't know how to even begin to unpick that crazy response of the authorities. He was armed, disguised and hiding at the Prince and Princesses of Wales residence. But nothing to see here. Why wouldn't you be carrying a 15 foot coil of rope if I'm not out in the street on a Tuesday and Sunday with my 15 foot coil of rope, my duct tape, my large knives, sometimes my samurai sword, wearing combat gear. I'm not having an ordinary week. It's as simple as that. Nothing to see here. Let me stay in this garden of my elderly neighbour. Don't get it. Just kind of throw it out there. Don't get it. And during the previous year, he'd been stopped four times in 10 months, hanging around Kensington Palace in the middle of the night. Is it just me? This is not just me, is it? This is not just me. It's not just me. Excuse me, mate. What are you doing? I'm just, uh, just hanging around the palace. Why? I like it. I'm a royalist. It's in the middle of the night. I know. But I'm just, it's like the stars. Why are you carrying that knife, mate? I like to imagine 
that if there were any tree falls around here and a small animal got stuck in the tree, I'd be able to get it out using my knife as a makeshift saw. Ha. Huh. All right then. See you again. Yes, I'll see you next month. I'm going to be here regularly. Honestly, that literally happened. So all of those details, many of you might know this case and not know that those details were actually there, that we actually know this about this individual. However, all the details that I've just told you about, they were not made public for a very long time. Much further down the line would that information come out because they didn't want to prejudice the judicial process that followed. But I don't know. I don't feel safe thinking that people act in such a manner ever. Now, George also, to add, I suppose, weight to the theory of him being a suspect, he only lived 500 yards from Jill's house. So he lived in a ground floor flat on Crookham Road, Fulham. But he was only actually considered as a suspect, seriously, about 10 months into the investigation. And that's probably down to the fact that there were like over 2,000 leads. So the sheer amount of leads that the police were dealing with and processing probably meant that they didn't actually get round to that one for that amount of time. Now, they were also working at this point with a forensic criminal psychologist, Dr. Adrian West. So he compiled this profile of this potential suspect in May 1999. That was just a month after the murder. And he had told the police, listen, you need to look for an obsessive loner. That was who he believed had carried out this crime. And of course, George, well, George fits the profile perfectly, doesn't he? Like I said, people call him a weirdo. And he's an oddball and he's somebody that you find in bushes armed with knives and rope, but he's just harmless, sorry. Just don't get it. Not going to be able to get it. Doesn't matter what the outcome of this story is. Doesn't matter about innocence and guilt at this point. What I'm saying is that kind of behaviour is deeply disturbing, full stop. Now, those who knew George, one of the things they would say about him was he was a fantasist. Apparently, it started in school. In truth, he was actually somebody who'd been very unwell with his mental health. He really had. And it, unfortunately, he'd slipped through the net hadn't received any of the help that he needed. He did things that were so strange and that were obviously causing concern in those who knew him, but it wasn't enough for him to actually be recognised as somebody who genuinely needed the support. So, for example, he once appeared in his local paper claiming to be the British karate champion. Except he wasn't the British karate champion. Now, that in itself means that He's got a delusional state of mind. He's willing to put himself in the local paper when he knows that people who actually know him would assume that that wasn't true because they recognise he's never done it. But that isn't going to change the consequences in his mind for doing this. The notoriety of being seen as successful is something that he uses to choose over the reality of the embarrassment it would usually cause us, knowing that our friends and family would be like, yeah, he never did karate, that's a really strange thing to do. So we see a level of delusion in that kind of behaviour. Also, and he must have been quite convincing, he claimed that he was a part-time stuntman, called himself Steve Majors, and somehow, and I mean, Please, God, explain this to me as to how this literally occurred. These days, in a more litigious society, one would imagine a level of due diligence would take place so that people can't just suggest they can do things and then be allowed to just do them. Because that's what happens. Calling himself Steve Majors, this stuntman, he persuaded a venue in Derby to host an event. And what an event that was. It was an event I might have gone and seen with respect at that particular time. He attempted to jump four double-decker buses on roller skates. I mean, personally, I'm imagining it. It's like an evil Knievel without the bike theme. But four double-decker buses are pretty big, right? And even though he wasn't a stuntman, and he had no formal training in this area. In fairness, in spite of the fact that this was just a delusion really that he created in his mind, he did actually complete the leap 
Sadly, it didn't work out quite as any of us would have wished for it to have played out because he actually fractured his femur and dislocated his spine. But when it comes down to it, he actually managed to leap over those four double-decker buses in roller skates. Pretty astonishing, I'm not going to lie. Aren't you a nutter? No. Um, I do stunts every day in my life and for the last 11 years I've not had one accident, so I think that's a good track record. They're coming down from approximately 60 feet, which is the very top of the ramp, down to about 20 feet, which is the other bottom of the takeoff ramp, clearing a 40 feet distance and landing on the other ramp, which is approximately 16 feet. What speed do you reckon you'll have to achieve to be able to clear it? We're hitting 60 feet, um, sorry, 60 miles an hour. That's moving at 88 feet per second. So you've never actually done anything like this before? Never in the world. It's never been done. But haven't you had a go on a mini ramp or anything just to have a practice? No, not at all. Crowd of 5,000 at the Long Eaton Stadium, the stuntman decided to go ahead. In the heavy rain and winds at gale force, I asked him why. Because I've been planning it for four years. I thought about it four years ago, training for four years. The chances are you're going to end up in the hospital. The chance I'll take. The weather conditions are very windy up here. I'm a bit frightened, but confident so far. I thought you'd wait until Tuesday myself. I've done it then. Why Tuesday? Well, there's another meeting, isn't there? Where the mighty have evaded, then. Well, I'll get halfway down. That's slim. He's rough down there. I hope I don't just shoot off the side. Now you have no chance of that, man. You stay centred. Don't look like safe to me. Can you get my hammer that down somehow? A hospital check later revealed a fractured femur and a dislocation to his spine. But with the adrenaline and the excitement still pumping, Steve insisted on a final wave to the crowd. Also in the past, he'd falsely claimed that his name was Paul Gad. For those of you who don't know Paul Gad, Paul Gad is Gary Glitter. That whole heap of child molester wrong, that criminal. Yeah, he was using his name. That was before the paedophile child molestation revelations but nonetheless again so he's got this desire to be seen as somebody different to who he is and he was actually once charged with impersonating a police officer that's a very serious offense when he turned up to court he was in glam rock attire and he stated that his name was paul gad he also claimed to be barry bulsara and he said that he was the cousin of freddie mercury apparently he idolized the late queen singer and actually freddie mercury's real name was frederick bulsara another thing that apparently he'd planned was to have plastic surgery to actually help him look like freddie mercury and at his sister's wedding in ireland this is at the height of the irish troubles in the 1980s he'd claimed he was in the sas and nearly got beaten up which you would do because if you're in ireland in the 1980s, when the IRA is rife and the troubles between the British and the Irish are enormous, particularly those with those very specific views about feeling that Ireland deserved to be independent and shouldn't have British rule or interference, to say you were a member of the SAS immediately puts you in a position of potential danger because you were seen as the enemy. So again, all of this, whilst it can almost seem humorous, to actually look at some of the activities that he got involved in, some of the things that he said about himself, turning up in glam rock gear to a court. With respect, this should be leading people to say, this man's struggling. He's very delusional. He's acting in a way that actually puts himself in serious danger, serious danger. We know the injuries that he had from doing that particular roller skating stunt. That could have killed him. And noticing that, and implementing some kind of supportive mechanism around him, but that doesn't occur. And so these kind of scenarios, they continue. Now, as well as George actually fitting the psychological profile that had been created, he did also have experience with firearms. So he spent nearly a year 
in the Territorial Army. This was in the 1980s, in the early 1980s. And he was actually taught at that point how to maintain and shoot assault rifles and machine guns. So there is some history with firearms. Also, the police had one witness who did claim to have seen George near the murder scene four and a half hours before the actual killing took place. And furthermore, whilst he didn't, with respect, fit the description exactly of the man fleeing the scene, he did share several of the characteristics. So the suggestion then came in that, well, okay, it is possible that he could have been present at the time of the murder. Also, and again, this is something that I think made him seem more of a potential suspect. Following the actual killing, he'd made some real considerable effort to create an alibi for himself. And that does spark suspicion. So when we are in a scenario where we're being questioned by the police about something that happened a week earlier, very often we don't even know what happened because we're not living our life plotting what we do every moment to protect ourselves. We just go through the motions of living and hope that nothing terrible is going to happen. And if it does, and then we're questioned about it, it's often quite difficult to piece together our movements. It really is. But George had made this effort to essentially be seen on the day of the killing. So first of all, he'd gone to a taxi firm it's around 1 p.m. Apparently he seemed in a hurry to go, but he didn't have any money for the actual ride. So he'd hung around. Then by luck, the taxi firm had actually received a call to drop off a package near where George wanted to go. I mean, that is lucky. I'm not being funny. I've never had a free taxi drive in my entire life. But nonetheless, seems like this particular taxi company were lovely and he'd been given a ride for free. Now, two days after that killing, he'd returned to the taxi firm. He'd at length talked about Jill's murder and he'd even said to the manager of the taxi firm, according to them, that he didn't want to be blamed. So he asked the manager, do you remember me being there on the day of the murder? Asked him, what time was I there? What had I been wearing? What were the color of my clothes? And apparently he kept giving them really bizarre hints until this guy guessed correctly. So in reference to his shirt, he was like, look up in the sky. So when the manager looked up, he was like, oh, blue? And he said, no, that's the wrong color, look again. So asked what color the sun was, the guy replied orange and he told him to guess again until he actually said yellow. So even though he wasn't directly telling him what he'd worn, he basically was because he was making him play a guessing game until he got the appropriate clothing that he was wearing. And that fell off for the individual that was being asked those questions. Equally, if you think about the mindset of somebody who may have mental health struggles, they may have classifications they're unaware of at the time, it could be if they've got an obsessional quality to their particular nature that when something plays out, they actually want to make sure that they aren't assumed or accused of something and they fixate on this and then go back through the motions to figure out how they can explain why they are not guilty by making sure that they're the appropriate people in their world who can give them the appropriate alibi because they're so concerned. So that is also a potential theory, isn't it? That he could literally have been dotting the I's, crossing the T's. He was innocent on the day when he was at the taxi rank and then once the murder played out and he was thinking maybe they'll think it's me then he goes back and traces those steps and creates a much more fixed regime for people to understand that he couldn't possibly have been in a because he was at b but actually in doing so he actually makes himself seem quite guilty now we get to the 17th of april 2000 this is almost a year after jill's murder and at this point police actually get the go ahead to search george's flat and it's not great it really isn't. When you think about what they're searching for, the profile of the potential killer as noted by the forensic psychologist, and then them turning up 2,597 photographs of 419 women in George's flat that he'd basically stalked to some degree, that's immediately relatively unusual, isn't it? They won't come across that very often. And it makes the oddness of his behavior potentially seem a little bit more sinister in light of what they're investigating. Also, they have maps of his street that they find, and they also find 736 newspapers 
eight with material relating to Jill published before her death. So they also have, a, shall we say, breadcrumb trail of possibility to the fact that he has some interest around Jill. And he also had 54 of these newspapers containing reports of a murder. And there were also four copies of the Jill Dando Memorial issue of the BBC's in-house magazine, Ariel, along with weapon paraphernalia. They also saw that there was clear evidence of an obsessive personality. So the police found lots of handwritten notes and photographs. These related to BBC programmes and also BBC stars, including Anthea Turner, plus a list of models with details of the home addresses and agencies, pictures and articles about Princess Diana, even along with her car registration numbers. And they also found what appeared to be George wearing a gun mask and brandishing a handgun. And he actually did concede that it had been taken in his home, but then down the line, he denies that that picture was actually him at all. Now, it's also during a search that officers found a blue Cecil G overcoat. So this is hanging on a kitchen door. And George admitted it was his. During the subsequent police interview, he also admitted that he'd only ever worn it once. But he told the detectives that he couldn't actually recall whether it was worn on the day that Jill was killed. But obviously, he's made it clear that that had only ever been worn once. And that means if they find anything that can link to the crime, that's obviously going to be quite incriminating if he said he never wore it any other time. Now, subsequent forensic examination of that coat, well, it did discover crucial evidence, and that evidence would literally be key in the prosecution's case against him at the later trial. So the senior forensic science officer, they were able to find a single particle of firearm discharge residue. And that was in the inside right pocket, and it measured just 11.5 microns. Now, for those of you who don't know what microns are, and I didn't, that actually works out about a hundredth of a millimetre. So tiny, 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 tiny. And furthermore, that actual particle matched the FDR found in both the cartridge case and on Jill's hair. Now that means it potentially places George at the murder scene. So with all of this evidence as far as the investigators are concerned, on the 25th of May 2000, that's more than a year after the actual killing of Jill, he's arrested on suspicion of her murder. And he's actually formally charged four days later on the 29th of May. Now, during that interview, I would say he doesn't do himself any favors whatsoever. So bear in mind what I've told you they found in his house, the fact that he's got copies of her memorial, magazine, etc., multiple copies in fact. He actually claims that he doesn't have any knowledge of Jill Dando. He says that he doesn't have any interest in her life. He doesn't have an interest in her death. And the problem is that that doesn't make sense. First of all, she's a really well-known TV personality and everybody knew who she was. And on top of that, there are newspaper articles before her death. So this is not doing him any favors. Pressed any other guns other than the two you've just mentioned? Just the two I've just mentioned, sir. I think you're lying, Mr. George. Was there a reason? To my knowledge, that has changed him that I purchased her. Seems to me, Mr. George, you certainly possessed at least two weapons, two firearms, if not three, whether they be replica, blank firing, or imitation firearms. That's right, isn't it? At least two, if not three. Is that right, Mr. George? Only those two, sir. Did you kill Jill Dando? No, sir. You obviously had firearm ammunition to use in your blank firing gun, as we've discussed. Is that correct, Mr. George? They were just... Um, capsules, sir. But, as I said, go bang, and that's all they do. But if you put a bullet on the end of that capsule and put it in a gun that could fire, with a smooth barrel... It couldn't do nothing, so it would blow up. 
and your, your own face because obviously nothing can get out of the end. So since that time, when you used that, that firearm to shoot your blank weapon, blank ammunition, have you ever bought or possessed any other firearm ammunition? No, sir. Did you kill Jill Danbo? No, sir. The person who killed Miss Danbo was seen leaving the area. He was wearing a dark three-quarter length coat. You have stated in interview that on that day you may have been wearing a three-quarter length coat. Was that you leaving the scene of the crime, Mr George? Or casual appearance. Exactly. Was that you leaving the scene of the crime, Mr George? No, sir. Your three-quarter length coat was taken from your flat. So I'm searched by the police. Sir. That coat has also been examined by a firearms expert, firearms laboratory. Did you kill Jill Dando, Mr George? No, sir. The inside pocket of your coat has been found to have a trace of percussion primer discharge residue. Did you kill Jill Dando, Mr George? No, sir. How do you explain the firearms residue in your coat pocket, Mr George? The coat pocket, the three-quarter length coat that you may have been wearing on the day that Jill Dando was killed. How do you explain that? I can't explain. I have no knowledge. Been even there. Of course you haven't. But how did it get there, Mr George? I have no idea, sir. And also he says that he doesn't know Gowan Avenue, but he'd actually lived close to that road in a flat for 10 years. So that's difficult for the investigators to comprehend. That noted, if I'm really honest, I've lived here six years in this current house and I genuinely only know one road that a friend lives on near me. So... I don't think it's that unusual that somebody would live in an area and not be that aware, unless you are a paper girl or boy. If you ask me around my parents' area, all the roads, I am like a savant because I delivered with my achy shoulders and permanently damaged back thousands of papers for what can only be described as piecemeal money. Anyway, the point is, unless you do happen to have a job where your job is to know the area, why would you? But again, when you add that to the picture they're painting, it doesn't look great for George. And during questioning, one of the things that he definitely stuck to is he said he had absolutely no involvement in her murder whatsoever. So this isn't an individual who in any way blurs the boundaries by saying he knows certain things, but that he doesn't know other things or changes his story. He's just adamant, I had nothing to do with Jill Dando's murder. We get to the 23rd of April, 2001. Now this is when the murder trial, which was massive, massive news. This begins at the Old Bailey, probably the most famous court in the land in the UK. Now, prior to the actual trial, George had pleaded not guilty to Jill's murder. He'd stuck to that. And in the interim, he'd actually been diagnosed with ADHD and Asperger's syndrome, along with personality disorders, actually various personality disorders. So this included histronic personality disorder. For those of you who don't know what histronic is, one of the big characterizations of that particular disorder is that you have attention seeking behavior. He was also diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder. I will tell you that the defense actually refuted those findings. And even though we can say histronic personality disorder, that really does link in with his behaviors. I mean, he wore skates and lied about him being a stuntman and nearly broke his spine because he decided to travel across four double-decker buses. I mean, he said that he was a karate champion. It certainly fits histronic, without a doubt. But I think narcissistic personality disorder, if you manage to get a psychiatrist to assess somebody with this particular disorder, well, it doesn't look good in front of a jury. Narcissistic personality disorder makes you look pretty antisocial, very self-centered, and somebody who really cares about themselves and nobody else. And that could create a bias in the jury. So the defense say that it wasn't true. Those findings were incorrect. And again, I think that unfortunately, we do see 
in cases where one psychologist or psychiatrist agrees or disagrees with another and it can certainly bias the actual jury because they think well they're the kind of person who would do it if they're narcissistic and so on and so forth one of the things that the defense decided they weren't going to do during the entire trial was to put george on the witness stand they didn't want him to be cross-examined they didn't think that he would make a good witness. And on one level, it actually makes perfect sense. If you put George on the stand, somebody who is a fantasist, somebody who we know tells lies about his history, his capacity, his ability, he denies things like having any knowledge of Jill Dando and so on and so forth, you are gonna be able to pretty much make him out to be the biggest liar ever. But even if you are a biggest fantasist that has ever graced the stands in the Old Bailey, that still wouldn't make you necessarily guilty of a murder. But if you are a jury member and you're watching somebody just totally disintegrate as far as being seen as credible, then that is going to have a massive impact on what you decide that person is guilty or innocent of. Equally, the problem with not putting somebody on a stand is the jury go, hang on a minute, if this person's got absolutely nothing to hide, why aren't they giving evidence? Why aren't they allowing cross-examination? So it's a rock and a hard place where the defense is concerned. Now the prosecution, they believe they've got a really strong case. They outline four main categories of evidence to the jury. So they argue that these four main categories of evidence basically show that George is guilty beyond reasonable doubt. So primarily they say, look, a witness literally placed him at the crime hours before the killing. So he's seen scoping it out, shall we say. Secondly, constantly lies to the detectives and we can evidence that he has lied consistently to the detectives. He claimed he had no interest in Jill Dando, for example, but actually what they found out is he developed a very dark obsession for her. So they can discredit him that way. Thirdly, he desperately attempted to create this alibi for the time of the killing, when essentially they say he didn't have one. So again, he's going out of his way to create this, from their perspective, fabrication of movements prior to the killing. And the fourth, but I suppose one of the ones that they thought was very important at the time, there was that single particle of firearm discharge residue that actually matched the FDR at the crime scene. Now they argued that the chances of this being the result of external contamination were so remote that it could basically be discounted. So the prosecution is saying that residue is basically like a fingerprint. There's no way it could have come from anywhere else and therefore that ties this individual to the scene of the crime. Now, the crucial testimony in this case, it came from the forensic ballistics experts for both the prosecution and the defence, obviously, because both sides are going to bring somebody in to essentially discredit the other. So Mr. Keeley, who was the prosecution's expert witness, he concludes that the fact that only a single particle of FDR was found was insignificant, but not unusual. So in his experience, FDR, regardless of how little, ended up on the firer of the gun, not the members of the public in the vicinity. So he concludes, therefore, that the FDR particle found in George's coat was consistent with having come from the cartridge that was used in the killing. Meanwhile, we have Dr. Lloyd. Now, he's for the defence, and they argue that it is incredible, absolutely astonishing to rely on this single FDR particle, especially a particle that was found a year after the killing. So he argues it could have been a result of innocent contamination. And he claimed that the reason that he was confident this could be the case was the police procedures that were used were flawed in this regard. So it's kind of a stalemate as far as that information is concerned. But again, if you're on a jury, one of those experts says that this tiny, tiny piece of FDR has been found and at the end of the day, it was found on Barry George. Therefore, can we discount and discredit that? I think it's difficult for a member of the jury, particularly if they don't really understand anything about ballistics, etc. They're going to find it very difficult to say that isn't compelling. 
So the cornerstone of the defence's case, because clearly the defence is going to rebuff all of these remarks and beliefs that the prosecution are putting forward, they say, look, Jill's murder was an assassination, pure and simple. It was meticulously planned. It was thoroughly professional. And they said, as far as they were concerned, it had been ordered by Serbian warlord Arkham. Now, they say this is in pure retaliation for the NATO bombing of the radio television of Serbia headquarters. Interestingly, Arkan himself, he was subsequently assassinated the following year, about in January 2000. The prosecution, of course, they said this is absolute rubbish. This is just sensationalist media nonsense. There is none of this borne out in truth. The weight of the evidence certainly doesn't support this. You're making it up. You're just trying to dissuade the jury from actually seeing the reality of George's guilt. So one of the things that they say is it's basically the sensationalist media coverage that has created this particular idea. It wasn't even one that was taken seriously by the police. But the second thing they say is, look, Arkham had met BBC's foreign correspondent, John Simpson, in Belgrade the same day Jill was killed. If he had wanted somebody to be murdered by him, it would have been way easier for Arkin to just kill him if he'd wanted to. So the prosecution basically tried to minimise the defence's argument and give examples as to why what they're saying makes little sense. So we get to the 2nd of July 2001. This is more than two years after Jill Dando's death. There's a six-week trial. And actually, it takes almost 32 hours of deliberation. So that jury, they go away... And they take some time really thinking about the outcome of this trial, what that verdict should be. The jury come back and they convict 41-year-old George of murder. And that's by a majority of 10 to 1. So there's one person on that jury who was there for those 32 hours and probably more than one, which is why it took so long, I would imagine. They don't buy into this belief that George is guilty. But nonetheless, that majority is enough. Judge Mr Justice Gage, he subsequently imposed the mandatory sentence for murder, life imprisonment, and he stated this. Why you did it may never be known. It is probable that you can give no rational explanation. What you did deprived her fiancé, family and friends of a much-loved and popular personality. During the time... She was in the public eye. She'd done much good and brought much pleasure to a great number of people. As I said, Jill Dando was a British institution and her loss was felt by millions. Even today, you talk about Jill Dando, everyone has questions. Everyone feels that she is an individual who deserved full justice. And many people don't believe that she received that at all. Now... George has been convicted. He's been sent to prison. He's got a life conviction. But that's far from the end of this case. So first of all, from the get-go, lots of people expressed doubts about his guilt. They question the strength of the evidence that's used to convict him. George's own sister, Michelle Diskin, she really works hard. She leads the campaign to free a brother. At no point does she believe, even for a millisecond, that this man that she knows and that she loves could be capable of killing. And it is quite strange, this, but even women that he'd pestered in the past, they say, look, he was somebody who was a nuisance. He was somebody that, you know, wasn't a positive addition to my life. But I don't believe he would ever have had the intelligence to carry out an execution-style one-shot killing. So... There are mumblings of dissatisfaction about this conviction and a campaign by his own sister to change this conviction full stop, to overturn it. Now, after he unsuccessfully appeals his conviction, that was in July 2002, the Criminal Cases Review Commission received submissions from George's lawyers five years later. So this is in June 2007. Now, for those of you who don't know, the commission is basically employed to study possible miscarriages of justice. And after it takes a look at this, it subsequently refers the case to the Court of Appeal on the following grounds. It says, new evidence calls into question the firearms discharge evidence at the trial and the significance apparently attached 
to that evidence. So at this point, the defence are given the opportunity to submit fresh evidence for the appeal court's consideration. The defence, they go ahead and say, look, too much probative value has been attached to this particle evidence. When its value in the big picture, when you look at this properly, was actually neutral. So there was the same remote likelihood of finding a single FDR particle in George's coat a year later, whether or not he was the actual shooter. And the particle was no more likely to have come from the murder weapon as from some other external source, such as from being in the presence of someone associated with guns and um, that used ammo with the same percussion primer. So they say, you know, this trial we believe was found guilty, as far as our client is concerned, because of this particular presence of this tiny, tiny, tiny FDR that was found, and we don't believe it. We think that we can discredit this fully. And if the jury were convinced in particular by that particular piece of evidence, we do not feel that this conviction was safe. Now, at the original trial, the prosecution had argued that the chances of the FDR particle in George's coat being the result of external contamination was so remote that it could basically be discounted. However, the argument is that this had been an unsafe conclusion for the jury to actually reach. So they may well have presumed, through the process of elimination, that it therefore had come down to the fact that this particle had come from the actual murder weapon. When in truth, this was as equally unlikely. So that neutrality that was mentioned earlier by the individual who was working for the defence, that neutrality is something that they believe the jury didn't understand. That it could have come from the murder weapon, but it was as equally likely not to have come from the murder weapon. And that does shift the perspective of that particular evidence being something that would be seen as safe. So we get to November 2007. At this point, the appeal court actually do agree that the jury had been misled on the value of the FDR evidence. Furthermore, they say, it couldn't be determined how much the jury had relied on that evidence to convict George. And therefore, in taking that belief system in line, they felt that it was unsafe that George had been convicted on that evidence and therefore they ordered a retrial. The second trial that commences on the 9th of June 2008, this time that key piece of prosecution evidence, it was deemed inadmissible. So namely, the firearms residue evidence found in George's coat was not safe as far as they were concerned. So that had to be discounted. So the only remaining evidence of forensic evidence linking George to Jill's murder, it was this single fibre of grey-blue polyester. Now that had been discovered on the raincoat worn by Jill when she was killed, and the prosecution argued that that came from a pair of CNA trousers found at George's home. So they're linking that grey-blue polyester that they found on Jill's coat directly back to George. What I will say is for those of you out there who remember CNA, CNA used to be on every high street, used to get affordable clothing from there. I mean, they had more expensive clothing, but as a working class family, we were only ever in the affordable clothing area. But it was very popular. Everyone wore trousers from there. So again, mm, that diminishes to some degree the reality of the strength of that evidence. And the defence actually argue that. They say it could easily have come from another source. And the defence, they also produce analysis from a neuropsychiatrist. And that neuropsychiatrist actually brings in some pretty compelling evidence about George. They say he had severe cognitive impairment. In fact, they say that he had an IQ of 75. That's the lowest 5% of the population. Also, he apparently scored in the bottom 1% for memory and executive tests. And that should, at least, if that's absolutely correct, and that particular test was carried out appropriately and George took part in it in an authentic way, that would mean that he struggled to organise himself and carry out plans, which again would be quite compelling. 
I guess that some people would argue, well, for somebody who isn't capable of carrying out plans, he seems to be able to compile lots of literature and information on the women he was stalking and actually stalk people, which takes a level of actual organisation. And the fact that he's been caught in Kensington with a coil of rope and knives dressed in armour gear, again, that takes a level of thinking and cognitive reality and ration. But that wouldn't likely be entered into the court, of course, because that isn't relevant to the current case. So we then get to the 1st of August, 2008. Now this is nine years after Jill Dando has been killed. And to be fair, George at this point has served eight years in prison. And after the retrial, he's acquitted of the murder. Now, one of the things that is bizarre is that after he gets released from prison, he again states, listen, I had nothing to do with the murder of Jill Dando. I didn't kill her. But he additionalizes that by saying, the reason I know I didn't kill Jill Dando is because I was stalking another woman at the time. It's like the weirdest defense for why you're saying you didn't actually murder somebody. But again, I would say in defense of him, that does tie in to the neuropsychiatrist report about his cognitive impairment. Now there have been cold case reviews since George's acquittal. And I will tell you that they have found that Jill was the victim of a professional contract killer. Her death had been a hard contract execution with the gun barrel pressed to the head when discharged. And this had prevented both the assassin from being splattered with blood and also muffled the noise of the shot. So cold case reviews have come to that conclusion. In 2019, the British National Criminal Intelligence Service reported Jill's murder was in retribution for the radio television of Serbia headquarters bombing. So that belief again that the Serbian warlord Arkan had indeed ordered the killing. The bullet actually that they used to kill Jill was, to be fair, the same used in assassinations in Germany, it had the same markings on the cartridges. And just days before Jill's murder, the opposition journalists in Serbia have been executed in exactly the same way. So therefore, that is now one of the assumptions about how she and why she was murdered. To date, Barry George, who's now 63, who remains the only person to ever have been tried for Jill Dando's murder, and he actually went ahead and filed a £1.4 million compensation claim for wrongful imprisonment. And he's actually been refused compensation for all those years that he had behind bars because the law states it can only actually be paid when a new fact emerges to prove beyond reasonable doubt that an applicant did not commit the offence. So in effect, what they're saying is not innocent enough to be compensated, which, if you're innocent, must be incredibly frustrating because to lose eight years of your life is a travesty beyond measure. Now, in recent years, even more possible motives for Jill's murder have been put forward. This includes the possibility that it was a case of mistaken identity and that it was in retaliation for her investigation into crime and corruption in English football. However, I will also say that many still believe that the authorities got the right man originally. So the same man that was convicted back in 2001. Sadly, all of this speculation, it really leads to nothing. Because to this day, Jill Dando's murder remains unsolved. And for her family, for her friends, and actually for all the passionate advocates of her because she was such a fabric of the British media, it's so unfair, so wrong, that she genuinely hasn't deserved the justice that she fully deserves. And the legacy of Jill Dando continues because people want to know what happened. And with every passing month and every passing year, the reality is that bringing who killed her to justice becomes more and more of a distant possibility. This is one of those cases that shook the UK, in many ways shook the world. It made presenters realise that as much as they felt protected because they were in the media, they were quite the contrary 
And we've seen in modern days how stalking can turn deadly. Let's think about Christina Grimmie. If you haven't seen my video on her, go and watch it. It's absolutely horrific. The fact that these individuals in the public eye who are just sharing their talent, in Jill's case, her amazing presenting talent, and actually her kind and compassionate demeanor. She was one of those really lovely people. She genuinely was. She wore her kindness on her face, in her eyes, in her smile. I mean, to think that she got executed this way, but in modern days, as I noted, Christina Grimmie, she was killed by a fan who became fanatic and fixated and obsessed about her. It really does bring into social awareness and psychological awareness that anyone can be a victim. And sometimes the more famous you are, the more of a victim you potentially become. Jill Dando's murder shattered the safety that so many celebrities felt in their world that they were to some degree untouchable because they were so cherished in the public eye. This is one of those cases that is frustrating because I haven't got the answers for you. The only thing that I know is that an incredible woman, an absolutely adored daughter, a much loved fiance and friend met her end in the most horrific circumstances on the doorstep of her own home in a completely out of the blue murder that no one to this day can fully comprehend. In fact, the only person that understands why this happened is the person who pulled that trigger. I'd love to know your thoughts on this. I'm sure that you've heard about this murder. If not, hopefully I've introduced you to it in a way that's thorough. I'd love to know your thoughts and feelings, how you feel about George who served those years in prison. Should he have got that settlement at the end of the day, having your freedom stolen is horrific. Was it a case where the police were so desperate to convict somebody that they pieced this case together with the hope that it would be compelling enough and indeed was for a jury to accept? Or is this a situation where they fully believe they had the right man and he got away? Or do you believe like the cold case reviews that Jill Dando was a cold-hearted execution? Let me know. Thank you so much for joining me. I will be back again, same time, same place, same space. Join me then, and like I said, still to this day, so many of us hope that we will get the answers about Jill's murder. Take care, guys. Be safe. <laughs>